and uh, thanks everybody for being here today. Um, it's so exciting when I talk to uh, students and people that are at the beginning of their professional journey. I I remember myself when I was in your shoes and, and I had so many dreams and aspirations and I had this hunger for knowledge. I would go to events like the one uh, Hank and the school organized today to, to hear um, what people that eventually... Are you still there? Can you still see me? I don't see you anymore. It may be my dogs. No, oh, there you are. Yeah, for a second. My dogs are working with my laptop and then <laughs> my screen disappeared. So I remember myself and, and going to this kind of event and trying to get inspired and, and, and then reading books over books over books. And uh, while I was waiting to connect with you today, I went in my LinkedIn and, and something happened. I was like, wow, uh, it was so... Uh, rewarding if you want one of my hero when i was uh, your age when i was at school was don norman um he wrote back then psychology of everyday things and then later on when i was already working i was at 3m he wrote emotional design and don has been always somebody yeah for me was a, a a theoretical pillar of the design world. He, he, I learned so much from what he was writing, but I was in Italy. It, Don was a far away figure, you know, almost mythical, almost not existing for me. I, I never dreamed of a future work in the United States or outside of Italy. I was just in Italy, a student and studying design and proud of Italian design and reading, you know, from many authors. And, and today there was a, I was again checking on LinkedIn and there was a post of somebody recommending different books. And, and this person was recommending my book and the book of, of Don Norman amongst others. And there was a comment of somebody that wrote something like, uh, I I particularly like the ideas and the theories and the content of Don Norman and Mauro Porcini. And for me, you know, literally like a child, you know, looking at that right now is like, wow, you know, so much happened in all these years. You know, it, it was such a mythical figure. And and now I'm here. And and if, you know, for me, this this is one of the big satisfactions that I have where I am today, today, uh, you know, in where I am today is not my compensation, is not my title, is not where I am in this corporation, is the possibility of having ideas, having the experience to put together these ideas in different kind of narratives and stories, in a book, in a podcast, in a conversation like the one I'm having with you today, and seeing that these ideas somehow are resonating they are valuable they're meaningful to people this is so exciting so uh, you know starting this conversation with you today my wish for all of you is to is to have a, an original point of view on what you do on your job on the world of design on your role within a big company or a startup in an agency or when you build your own agency understand what what is your uniqueness understand what is your point of view and your perspective in everything we do, but also get inspired by others, read as much as possible, go to conferences, travel, talk to people, and, and, and use all these insights, inputs, data to then create your original point of view. And, and my wish for you is to find yourself in 20, 30 years doing what you love and having people that love what you do. This is a magic formula, you know, doing what you're passionate about, passionate for. And then why you do that, you have people that actually love what you're doing is my the best wish that I can have for you. So what happened in these many years, uh, you know, starting as a student out of Milan, um, I I got, I did my thesis on wearable technologies. I, I have a master degree in industrial design. I did my thesis with Philips, imagining the future of society the role of technology in the future. And particularly, I was working on wearable technologies. I joined Philips for almost one year. And then I left because I met um, a celebrity in Italy that had nothing to do with the design world. This was a music producer and a DJ 
big, big name in, uh, in the Italian uh, television. And the guy was intrigued by this new world of the web and the digital and internet. It was starting back then. It was the end of the 90s, beginning of 2000. And he was <laughs> investing in this world, trying to figure out exactly what to do and if he could be in any kind of enterprise or business in the world. So long story short, I meet the guy. We decide to, I was 24, we decide to create an agency together. And for almost three years, I've been working on on one side on the digital content of many, many singers and DJs and celebrities in Italy, their CDs, uh, their internet sites. Uh, and then on the other side, we were trying to figure out how to innovate in the world. We, we One of the most important projects we were working on is what you would call today um, cryptocurrency. We were thinking, dreaming of a digital currency that we, you could use in the in the uh, internet, in the uh, uh, digital world. We're talking about the year 2000 and then cryptocurrency was invented, I think in 2007, 2008. So he was really thinking about the future and trying to innovate in that kind of world. It was too early, by far too early. And so we closed that company uh, after two years and a half of activity. And then I found myself in a big corporation once again, 3M technology company from Minnesota. I started with a middle level position managing design for the consumer business in Europe. Consumer business being one of the six businesses of the company. After 10 years, uh, I was in the US. I became chief design officer of the company. We had teams in uh, Japan, in China, in the US, in, uh, in Italy, and in Brazil. And from that, about 10 years ago, I moved to PepsiCo. I joined PepsiCo and I started this wonderful journey in this company, uh, starting from scratch. It was just me. I was the first chief design officer of the company. Today, we have more than 350 designers uh, in 15 different cities around the world. Uh, I mentioned this itinerary because there is something uh, pretty rare that happened in all these years that doesn't happen that often and has been very valuable for me um, in the journey. For a reason or the other, I had to force myself to practice different phases of design, to learn different aspects of design. So here I am, I am an industrial designer, uh, specialized in new technologies, and that's what I did in Philips at the beginning. And then I jumped in something completely different. That was the world of digital. So I had to learn, first of all, to become better in my graphic design skills. I had to learn all the world of digital. So I had to learn coding and a variety of different softwares to create internet sites and digital content. And then I, I, I started to learn more and more what innovation was about, how to really approach anything I was doing. It could be the cover of a CD or the digital content of the CD, all the way to inventing something that later on somebody else called cryptocurrency. Anything I was doing, the idea was, how can I do something that nobody ever did before? This mindset, this obsession. Back then, this celebrity that I mentioned, and in the book I, I wrote, there is an entire chapter about him. His name is Claudio Cecchetto. He taught me that. The, the most important um, uh, learning of those years is this mindset of always thinking, how can I do something that nobody ever did before in every single project that I uh, that I joined in every, even in, 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 in when they gave me a job with a job description, I was thinking, okay, how can I do more than what the company is expecting? How can I really change the game? I can, I, how can I do it in a meaningful way, leveraging the resources that the organization is giving me? Then I, you know, after that experience, there is 3M. In 3M, I enter as an industrial designer, but I need, I, I very quickly realized that to leverage design, to build value for the company, I needed to touch all the different dimensions of design. I needed to work on how design was helping the branding, uh, traditional media, new media, communication experiences, 360 approach to design. And that's essentially what I've been doing in that company and how I became the first chief design officer of the company and I built that capability from scratch. And here in PepsiCo today, this is essential. In my leadership team, I have uh, nine vice presidents reporting to me with different kind of roles. One of the key 
characteristics that you need to have from a pure technical standpoint, I'm not talking about the soft skills that are very important to me, but from a technical standpoint, is this ability to understand all the different dimensions of design. Because one day, let's say you are running design for Pepsi, one day you are working on uh, the visual identity of the brand. Another day you work on the special edition or limited edition packaging uh, uh, for Super Bowl. Uh, the next day you're working with the fashion brands from this square to Puma to Dolce Gabbana uh, or Zara and H&M to create fashion collections inspired by the brand. And then the next day you're working with experts of equipment to create the vending machine of the fountain of the future with digital screens, able to customize the drink on the base of your needs, on the base of your preferences. So essentially you need to touch all the different aspects of the brand, the touch, the, the touch points of the brands and have the ability to understand how to leverage design to build value in all these dimensions. This is the role of a leader of an organization uh, like PepsiCo. Um, every time you run a specific business, a specific brand uh, with a design perspective. So in my case, again, the different opportunities, the different jobs and, and my proactiveness to put myself, you know, to get out of my comfort zone and learn new areas gave me the possibility to learn uh, the different phases of design and leverage that in the position I have today. Uh, it, when I look at my team, the hundreds of people in my team, you know, we ask ourselves as leadership team of this organization, how can we help them getting that kind of exposure? Let's say you are a graphic designer. How can you learn the, the world of innovation, of strategy, of digital, of uh, industrial design? And, and, and we try in a variety of different ways to expose these people to all the different disciplines within the organization. They all sit together under one umbrella. But one of the things we look at the most is one of the soft skills that then I talk about also in the book, and that is curiosity. Curiosity is key. And, and so we look at our organization, we look at our people, and we look how curious people are, how willing to get out of their comfort zone they are to learn new things uh, how uh, they talk to people with a different background how to uh, how they try to learn new skills um, and these skills could be design skills but it could be also the skills of business of marketing in in a company at PepsiCo we are exposed to amazing marketers many of the fortune 500 CEOs are actually PepsiCo alumni business people in PepsiCo, they left the company, became CEOs of big corporations we're all familiar with. So we know that today, you know, there are so many business leaders in the company that will be the future CEOs and CMOs of the company. And so this is all an opportunity for the curious people, for the curious mind, for the people that understand that every encounter, every opportunity is an opportunity to grow and learn. And designers today, you know, the des design leaders, no matter if you're a leader in a corporation or you're a leader of your own agency or startup, the design leader is somebody that combines this holistic approach to design that I just explained with also the business mindset, the ability to understand how to leverage that approach to branding, to innovation, to grow a business. Because the business platform at the end of the day is what unlock our ideas, what give our ideas the possibility to reach as many people as possible. Something that I love of working in these corporations, for instance, working in PepsiCo, is that I know that I can reach billions of people every day with my ideas, with the products that I generate, with the uh, content that I produce. And by the way, if you work in an industry uh, with structural opportunities, sustainability, health and wellness, um, or the possibility to customize and personalize our offerings, our products on the base of your specific needs, the opportunity of what technology can do in all of these. If you know that there is all of this, entering companies like this with this level of resources and reach to billions of people is fantastic for us designers because we can really impact society. We can really create something valuable in time that make the difference in a positive way at scale.
Now, for all of these, often we talk, you know, when we talk about a career for designers inside these companies, big and small, whatever company, usually we focus so much on the technical skills. We review the portfolios of these people. And this is what I've been doing for many years at the beginning of my journey. I was in 3M, I was hiring my team, I was building my team. And I, I would review hundreds of portfolios. Uh, I was giving uh, the, the recruiters a, a series of directions of what kind of people, what kind of mindset I needed. But the focus was really on the technical skills and hiring the best possible designers that I could hire. And so with this, uh, designers, we started to do a series of projects. At the beginning, you know, a few projects, dozens of projects, hundreds of projects over the years. There were designers, and then there was the marketing team, there was R&D, there was consumer insights, all the different functions. And looking, and, and I was trying to introduce a series of tools that I learned at school that I heard about in conferences, I read about in book, uh, in books. I was a big, big promoter of design thinking, the methodology of design thinking. So here I am with these big dreams and ambitions. I joined 3M thinking, wow, I'm really going to help changing this company, introducing design-driven innovation, this idea of human centricity that is so close to the way we operate as designers. And so I introduce all these tools. I call in all kinds of agencies to help us. And again, we start to run dozens of projects and then hundreds of projects. And I look back and I realize that a variety of projects were doing very, very well and many others were not. And so I was like, oh, maybe I need to tweak the way of working and the processes and, and the way you know the team uh, interact with each other and all these things. I tried to do all these things and, and still <laughs> many projects were working very well and a variety were not until at a certain point I realized what was really making the difference. And the difference was all driven by the people assigned to those projects. At the point, at a certain point, I realized that I needed to be really strategic about these people. I needed to understand how they were thinking, how they were behaving, how they were acting. Uh, you know, when I talk about these abilities, I'm talking about the ability of people to observe the world understand reality, feel people, understand needs and dreams of these people and translate them into data, insights, input to generate your concept, your idea. And then once you have them, the ability to take them back after you prototype, you have your concept, take them back to these people, interact with them, understand you know, what to tweak, how to evolve things, is the ability also to interact with the other functions of the organization, with R&D, with marketing, how to bring them with you, how to inspire them, how to leverage a completely different kind of know-how and background. How to, when once you have the idea that you really believe in, how to push it through the complexity of the industry, the complexity of the company, the bureaucracy eventually of the company, how to have the resilience, the courage to take through that idea all the way to market. Because innovation at the end of the day is not a great idea. You know how many times we, we see a company that has a great idea, launch it in market, is very successful. And then you hear so many designers and agencies or innovators of any kind writing in LinkedIn or in Instagram, oh, I had that idea 10 years ago. Well, the difference between an idea and innovation is taking that idea and taking it to market in a successful way. That journey from idea to innovation is full of roadblocks, is full of difficulties, is the feasibility of that idea. And therefore, you need to understand all the constraints from a manufacturing standpoint. Is consumer research that is killing anything is really breakthrough, is really disruptive, is really polarizing. And therefore, you need to have the ability as a designer to talk the language of human science and understand how human consumer research works and understand how to protect the integrity of your idea, how to listen to people, but do not believe them, I usually say, and how to convince your consumer insights people, you know, the researchers inside the organization to re take risk with you. Because innovation at, at the end of the day is always a risk. And when you have zero risk, you're probably not innovating because it means that somebody else did it before you and you have full variables and data to tell you what to do. And that's not innovation anymore. So 
Those kind of skills, I just mentioned a few, are really important. And many years ago, I was in 3M. I decided to write them down on a piece of paper. And just, you know, and it's like a prototype in design thinking. You know, the moment you write down something. So for instance, imagine, write down what is important for you as a student, and then, you know, thinking about yourself as a designer in, in the world, what are the key qualities, characteristics that you think are important? I wrote them down for myself. The moment I was writing them down, looking at them already that, you know, in the moment I was like, wow, I wrote this. Is it really true? Is not? Let me investigate this more. Let me validate that idea. But long story short, I came up with this list of different characteristics. I then I gave them to the recruiters, to the HR team. And I asked them to hire people using these characteristics as filters. And then I used these characteristics also for myself as a compass. And, and you know, I realized today at the beginning it was all blurred. You know, I, I was just trying and experimenting, but more and more I realized how important it's been for me to have full clarity about what were the soft skills, the characteristics that I needed to succeed inside these complex organizations and then also in society and in the world. And when I say succeed, by the way, is a very broad definition of the word succeeding. It's not just about growing yourself inside an organization, reaching certain positions. First of all, it's much more than that. It's about believing in something, having a dream and creating, in this case, a new organization, a new culture inside an established a company and culture and organization. So that was, you know, for me, a component of the dream. But when I talk about success, it's much more than that. Success for me is happiness, is balance, is something uh, that transcends your professional life, is when your private life and your professional life are blended together in a very balanced way, once again, to give you happiness and satisfaction for what you're doing. And, 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 and so these 23 different characteristics today are 23 characteristics that I, that I talk about in the book are all about this. Some of them are more obvious when you talk about innovation and changing the status quo, no matter what you apply innovation to. Again, it could be a graphic design project of a new a piece of communication for a campaign all the way to invented inventing the iPhone, you know, is about innovating in what you do, no matter what is what you do. So when you talk about innovation, one of the skills is the ability to dream. You know, as, as human beings, we're all born with that ability. When we're born, we all dream as children. We dream, we dream, we dream until somebody starts to tell us that actually dreaming is childish. Is you know, it's not something that adults do too much, but you keep dreaming, you dream, you go to school, you go to college and you keep dreaming, you get out of school, you go to these companies and you think that you can change them. You dream, you, you can change the product, you can change the brand, you can change an entire organization, you can change society or an industry with your ideas. We dream, you still dream when you are in college, you still dream when you just get out until once again, People remind you that dreaming is very childish. You should stop doing that because now you're in the world of adults and you need to stop dreaming and be concrete and be pragmatic. Actually, even worse, you will find people that will tell you, why are you so arrogant to think that you can change this company, you can change this brand, you can change this product if nobody really did it before you? Why are you so arrogant to think that? And so you will start to think that actually dreaming is wrong that is childish indeed. And instead it's not. Few of you, we keep dreaming. Many of you, we stop dreaming. My wish for you is that you don't stop dreaming. Keep dreaming all the time. And know that when you dream, you will face the most of the people, the vast majority of the people, they will tell you that is wrong, that you shouldn't. It's okay. If, if they don't tell you, it means you're not really thinking big enough. Now, the problem is that dreaming is not enough. You know, dreaming actually, when you are, you get over what people are telling you, you really start to think big and dreaming actually is very comfortable. It's fun, you know, it is a comfort zone. And there are 
some people that are really big dreamers, but are unable then to make things happen. So the unicorns, the people I talk about in the book, these people in love with people, the real innovators, the real design disruptors are people that are able to balance the ability to dream with the ability to make things happen. Pragmatism, you know, having, having a very concrete approach, understanding that the different trade-offs and compromises you take on the way are just a step towards your dream. They're not, you're not betraying your dream with those trade-offs and compromises. You're not going to change a company or a brand from night to day. You need to do it step by step incrementally. Then you will try to speed up things as much as possible, to scale up things as much as possible. But the reality is that innovation is a journey. And so the real innovator is somebody that is able to combine the ability to, to have a vision, a dream, understanding where you want to go. And then go back to today and step by step building towards the future and understanding that the compromise is not betraying the integrity of the dream. But to do that, you need to have a dream and you need to understand what is the integral idea of your dream. If you just execute, you know, I met so many people in my life that are great executors, they're great soldiers, but they miss that ability to build the vision, the strategy. And then what you do is meaningless because it's not producing anything that is changing the game. Now, these characteristics, you know, these are just two out of 23, are kind of obvious when you talk about innovating in what you do. Still, when you work in companies, big and small, they are not so easy to find. There are other characteristics that are less obvious, and but they have been really, really important in my journey, and they are imperative in the culture of our organization. They are a key filter when we hire people and is a key filter for growing people in my organization. If you don't have these characteristics, you will never be a vice president of design within our organization in PepsiCo, as an example. I'm talking about, for instance, the power of kindness, the power of optimism, the power of curiosity that was mentioning earlier, the power of respect, and a variety of other characteristics. But I'm mentioning in this few because somehow then they link with so many others. Uh, let's talk, for instance, for a second about optimism. You know, I hired years ago people that were great designers, very holistic approach, very business savvy, but they were not very optimistic. They were very pessimistic. And what is the problem when you don't have that kind of positive attitude towards the world? First of all, you're not going to think every time that you can change the status quo. You know, the optimistic people are always there thinking, well, there is this, but I can do it better. So first of all, you're not having that kind of starting point. But even if they force you to do it, that's the brief. So work on that, change the status quo. You will start to face all kinds of roadblocks, all kinds of problems, because that's the nature of innovation. And if you don't have that kind of energy that comes out from looking at the glass half full instead of half empty, you're going to give up. You're going to give up for sure. Sooner or later, you will give up. Now, Optimism, as any other characteristic in this list of 23 traits of the unicorns, is partially natural. There are some people that are more optimistic than others by nature. I am for sure optimistic in my genetic code. Partially is that. But then, no matter how great you are in a specific skill that you have, hard or soft skill, you need training, you need practice, you need education. So the ability to understand what are those 23 characteristics, so the awareness about them is important because then you're going to train, you're going to practice those characteristics. And optimism, yes, we were talking about optimism, is a good example of this. There are situations, you know, let's take my personal situation. There are moments where Gosh, I mean, the roadblock is so big and there are so many difficulties in the specific project or even in my life, you know, very difficult moment in my life. I'm like, I can't be optimistic in the moment. It's so difficult. And so what I, there are different techniques that I use. One, for instance, is that I try to step back and I try to remember the dream where I'm trying to go. That already excites me, give me a lot of energy. Then I also try to, look back and understand where I'm coming from and the steps that I did to arrive to where I am today. I try also to remember the mistakes that I made 
in the past. And I remember how many of the failures, the mistakes, the error that I made actually were a learning point, gave me so much, made me a better person, a better designer, a better uh, business leader. So I try to put things in perspective. All of a sudden, the gigantic difficulty of that day change scale and become more easy to manage. Another thing that I do, and this is at a certain point in the book, I talk about mentorship, a different kind of mentors, uh, not traditional mentor. You know, I believe strongly in mentorship. I never had a mentor in my entire life, a traditional one, but I had different kind of mentorship figures. And one of these mentorship uh, idea that I talk about is the idea of the uh, meta mentor. Essentially, you know, it's very difficult to find in, in, in your journey people that embody all the 23 characteristics. Um, by the way, the idea of these unicorns, these people with all these characteristics, well, the unicorn itself is somebody that doesn't exist, is an idea. Plato will say the unicorns live in the world of ideas. And so once we have clarity on the 23 characteristics, what we need to do in our life is to practice them every day and try to better ourselves in all these dimensions to become a unicorn, knowing that we'll never become unicorns. So now if we are people that look for mentors, knowing that it's difficult to find people with so many characteristics developed to the extreme, and especially maybe if you don't live in Miami or in New York, but you live in a little village in Africa or in the middle of the United States or in the mountains of Italy, wow, it's so difficult to find this caliber of people. What I did over the years is to at least identify people in my circle that had at least one of the characteristics. So the most kind person that I knew, the most optimistic person, the most, the person with the higher sense of style, because that's another characteristic of the unicorn, the, the most visionary, the greatest in executing things. And so every time now we go back to optimism, you know, in the, in those moments where I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? I think of this person, maybe it's a couple of people that are really, really optimistic. And I think, how will they behave in this moment? What will they do? And this is true for all the other uh, characteristics. I think of, let's say I, I travel, I go all the way to India and I am there in New Delhi after traveling, you know, all the way to, actually <laughs> is a real case. I'm going there in a month and I was looking at flights and I'm leaving here in the evening of New York and I'm gonna be in India at 7 p.m. of the day after. So you are there, you are so tired from the trip but eventually you just have this, the other day there in, uh, in India, you have business meetings and everything. And, you know, you're like, oh, okay, my body is telling me just stay in the hotel, rest, relax. Tomorrow is a long day. But then I think, well, what my curious friend will do, you know, that super, super curious friend will do, would he lose the opportunity of being in New Delhi? and getting out and discovering people and places and learn and get excited and get inspired, will he lose that? So even if my instinct, because let's say I'm not particularly curious, would be to rest and stay in the hotel, through the meta-mentor meta methodology, I essentially force myself, I inspire myself to go out and be curious. So this is what the meta-mentor is about. Understanding the 23 traits and identifying people that embody them to the extreme and use them as your reference. You can even talk to them eventually if they are your friends to try to drive the kind of approach as much as possible. Uh, I was, I'm talking about uh, optimism. We talked briefly about curiosity. Uh, kindness is another one. And I'm going to close with kindness. You know, when you enter these companies, often they tell you the opposite. Kindness is weakness. Kindness is vul vulnerability. Uh, often you hear that actually you need to be a little bit of a shark to really succeed. We have so many amazing uh, leaders, even design leaders or business leaders that are really tough, that are really like the opposite of kind. And so we, we, we think that actually, you know, that's a value. The reality is that in the society we live in today, that is very different from the one of 20 years ago, is a society that is global, is high tech, is hyper competitive. The level of competition we have today is uncomparable 
with the level of competition that brands and companies had 20 years ago. Because today, the barriers to entry that they used to have are crumbling down under the winds of e-commerce, social media, uh, global the global market. So all these brands are under attack, not just from their main competitors that have they were very predictable, you know, inside out what they're doing, more or less, you know. No, now these brands are under attack from the new startups, the new commerce, the disruptors that come in in your industry, change the game of the, the, the rules of the game and, and compete in ways that you didn't expect. This is what happened with Airbnb in hospitality, with Uber in transportation and many other things. So we live in a society that is completely different and every company, big and small, needs to be hyper-efficient, hyper-effective and needs to have a focus on creating real value for people before anything else. So really this human centricity in the culture of the organization. But to do all of this, you need a certain breed of people with certain characteristics, the unicorns we're talking about. Kindness, something that was a nice to have, not the necessary 20 years ago, today is super important for multiple business reasons. First of all, if you are surrounded by people in your team that are not nice, they're not kind, what are the probabilities that you want to spend time with them? Probably you will end up going to work from nine to five and then rushing home and getting away from those people that you don't like. But if you are surrounded by people that are nice to you, that are kind, that are trust trustworthy, well, there is a high probability you're going to spend more time with them. You're going to have a meal. You're going to have a drink. You spend quality time with them. In the quality time, you're going to build a bond, a bond that is unique and is so powerful because in the next day, the next week, the next year, when you will face a difficulty in your project, in your industry, in your business, that bond will make the team hyper-efficient, will make you overcome all kinds of difficulties in a wonderful way. Or what are, you know, if, if you have uh, colleagues that you don't trust, that are not nice to you, there is a high probability you're going to do a series of things to protect yourself from them. Let's say that you're doing a project with your uh, with the other students at school and everybody has a role in that project, but you don't trust people you know, that are there with you. You think they have their personal agendas, they're doing things against the team. What are you, you going to do? Well, you're going to protect yourself by doing a series of things to be ready in case the, team, the teammate let you down. Now, all these activities are redundant for the company, for the team, for the school. So now think about PepsiCo, 300,000 people. Now multiply all these redundant, redundant activities, activities that are not necessary for the company, for the number of people the company has. You understand the level of invisible lack of productivity that lack of kindness is generating in these companies. Now I'm going to pause here for a second. You know, I'm talking about kindness, love, but then I'm using words like, productivity, efficiency. I'm trying to be the connector between the world of emotions, the world of love, the world of design, and the world of numbers, the world of finance, the world of productivity, the language that the CEOs and the business leaders of these companies talk, talk about. So if you talk about the, the value of love, and kindness is a dimension of the love, but there are many other characteristics in those characteristics that ladder up to love, in these companies, just as an ethical value, they're not going to listen to you too much. They're going to say, wow, that's wonderful. You hear the designer and the artist that talk about this. But if you start to link it to performance, to business value, to financial value, all of a sudden they're like, wow, that's really interesting. And so this is to close what the subtitle of the book talks about. The book title is The Human Side of Innovation. But the subtitle that I want, you know, I wanted the subtitle to be the title but I would have misled the readers with that subtitle becoming title. The subtitle is The Power of People in Love with People. There are three dimensions of love that I talk about in the book that made all the difference of the world in my journey and all the difference of the world for our team. First of all, is the love for the people we serve. Is that drive that we have to create something extraordinary for them. Now, this is something that as designers, we learn at school. When we go to design school, they teach us to observe people, understand their needs and wants, and create something extraordinary for them. 
this is a unique value that we have as a professional community. Do never forget this and actually celebrate this in the companies you will work for. Because if you go to business school, they teach you something very different. They teach you to grow a business, to move a business from A to B. Then they tell you, by the way, there is a lever that is called product and the lever that is called communication. You can use these levers, but you can be very successful as a business leader, as a company, even if you have an average product, an average, an average brand, if you use the other levers in a smart way, the supply chain, the distribution, the scale of the company. For us designers instead, we are obsessed with creating something extraordinary. For us, you know, for a business leader, you, you may have a mediocre product and be very successful in what you do as a business leader. If you grow the business, no matter the mediocre product, we designers, if we have a mediocre product, we stay mediocre designers. And so society needs more than ever designers inside these companies that are obsessed with creating quality for people. And it all starts with this love, this passion that we have for them to create something extraordinary for them and not being happy if the product, the service, that experience, the brand is not extraordinary. And the good news is that for the first time in history, in modern history of economy and business, the, the human value that we can create through our products and design is aligning to the financial value for these companies because those barriers to entry are crumbling down and either you have something extraordinary or somebody else if you don't, somebody else will do it in your behalf. But going back to this idea of people in love with people, and I promise I close, three dimensions. First, loving the people that you serve, that you design for, really being obsessed with creating something meaningful and, and, and relevant for them. The second love is the love for the people around you, is your colleagues, is your team. And, and it's really about, you know, connected to that idea of kindness, respect, empathy, bringing people with you. This is important because all of these drive efficiency and effectiveness for the companies. And is also, by the way, and that's for me the primary and most important reason why this is important is also beautiful. To be surrounded by beautiful, loving people, caring people is just beautiful and it's so important for our happiness. And finally, the third dimension of love is love for what we do, is passion. You probably heard from my tone of voice, my body language, the passion that I have for what I do. I love what I do. There is not really difference between my professional life and my private life. I know how to build boundaries. I was not able to do that, you know, many years ago. So I know how to carve out time for my daughter now, for my significant daughter. I learned that, but my mind and my heart are anyway 24 seven in, you know, thinking about how to have an impact on society through my ideas and through the resources that either my comp the company I work for or my network of people can give me to have that kind of impact. And this is my wish for you, to love what you do, to love the people you do, uh, whatever you do for, and to love the people surrounding you while you do all these things. I promised earlier I was going to close. I really, really promised that I close with this final idea. I promise. At the end of the book, I talk about how to design happiness. Because for me, as I said at the beginning, success is not wealth, is not material success, is not fame, is happiness. This is so, so important. And there are three dimensions that come from human science. The first one is working on yourself, doing something that essentially define you, define your identity. And your job is going to be, you know, an important component of it. So doing what you love and really having an original perspective in that is a component, but there is much more than that. Who are you, you know, as a person, as an individual? The second dimension is you and the people close to you, your family, your friends, eventually your very, very close colleagues at work. And it's about, is the idea of loving, giving love out and receiving it back. You do it in a selfless way. You don't do it to receive it back. But by definition, you will receive it back from the people close to you. So translated in the professional world is how to make sure to surround yourself with people that you really care about. And if in your company, in the situation you will be in, you don't find that, leave, leave. 
you know, there is a study that was published uh, that I read about yesterday. There is a study that started in 1938 on happiness, 1938, so almost 100 years of study. And they found out that one of the key drivers of happiness for people in society is relationships, relationships with people surrounding you. So this second dimension is key. The third one is doing something bigger than you, is a purpose in life. Is and, and it could be, you know, private life. In the world of design, for me, the purpose is to look at these companies just as platforms and and use the big platform and resources that PepsiCo is giving me to push the idea of human centricity, to pitch this idea, to really have an impact in society, to really move the agenda of sustainability, health and wellness in these companies, doing something that is bigger than you, is bigger than the company, and at the end of the day, anyway, is going to deliver value to the company, is going to deliver value to you. Usually, these kind of ideas come later in life for a simple reason. The more you get close to the moment of death, the more you start to think about legacy, the more you, you start to think about how to become immortal, how to defeat death. And so the idea of building memories, it could be being Steve Jobs and changing the world with true technology, but it could be also being my grandmother. And, you know, in, in the close community that she had, she's remembered as a kind, beautiful person. So it could be all of this, but focusing on these three dimensions, yourself, what you do, and then the people close to you, and then something bigger than you, apply this to your personal life, apply this to your job, and you will see that this is a beautiful recipe to be happy with everything you do. At least this is something that worked very well for me. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. My name is Tyler. I'm going to be one of the admissions advisors helping you guys to start your creative careers here with the Miami Ad School with our four portfolio programs, art direction, copywriting, photography and video and design, as well as our boot camps. We are well equipped to make you well equipped for the creative industry. And my job is to help you transition smoothly from prospective to enrolled student. We have financial aid and scholarships available for all of our portfolio programs and our four U.S. locations, Miami, Atlanta, San Francisco, and New York, as well as our international locations are ready for you guys to go ahead and enroll when you are ready. So feel free to go to our website, www.miamiadschool.com, hit apply now, start your application, and if you have any questions, set up a call, and we will be happy to help you.